what happened tonight was as we were doing praise and worship and as, there you go, and as the um, angelic things, whatever that was, was happening here, there is a release in the spirit realm. There is a release to uh, pray. Tonight also was a call to the intercessors. So if you are called as an intercessor, I hope you really felt stirred. Did you feel stirred tonight when you were doing a little warfare? Because in this plan, I'm sorry, it's probably a sermon for Sunday, but in the plan, we ha- there has to be intercessors, okay? There's got to be people praying. There's got to be people going out. There has to be in all of these things. And you might go, oh, gosh. I, don't, I just don't feel called to go out. But I feel like I need to stay on my face before God for hours every week. Okay? And others may feel like they, they want to go out um, and have purposeful, but you're going to have little cards with people's names on them to pray over. And that would be your open doors. We're coming up to Thanksgiving. So you're going to be around people that you aren't always around. You know, family members and people, uh, sometimes somewhat irritating people. But you'll be around people and family, and you'll get a chance uh, to, uh, to witness. And that's sort of what the message is on tonight, actually, which is kind of cool. Oh, I'm going to pray. God, I just pray that you would lead me in what the parts I'm supposed to say, let's do it. And the ones I'm not, help me skip over. Thanks, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. There are people out there that need Jesus. There are people outside these four walls. In fact, I get it, this vision every time I come here, the walls just collapsing. You know, you're called to go outside the church. Uh, the, one of the, a few years ago when I came, I kept seeing coals, embers, and coals on the ground. It wasn't just because your carpet is red. It was because I saw coals, and then I saw a wind come in and do the flames. Well, last time I was here, we had flames going, okay? So the flame part has happened. The next thing I saw uh, for tonight was a giant flame shooting up out of the very center of this church with the walls down. And this flame is that uh, call, call to the intercessors, call to the people to go outside the four walls of the church, a call um, of love. I feel like I'm just one piece of a puzzle. Like I, I, I'm here tonight and you've been getting other pieces. You've been experiencing the Holy Spirit in a great way here. You have been enjoying God's presence. You have, uh, you know, had people in where you were getting all filled up. And I think that's fantastic. We all need that. We all need to get filled up. We all need that. Um, But it is for a reason. Uh, It is to go out. And this flame that I saw, this flame shooting out of the very center that's going to shoot out of all of you is love. Everything that we do has to be grounded in love. I mean, you can go up to somebody and slap them across the side of the face and say, hey, you need Jesus. But you know what? They probably won't listen to you. You know? But they will with love. And there are people in our lives that are just plain hard to talk to. We got people, you got people at work, people in your family, people at the stores. Yeah, we're coming up into major shopping season. Woo, you're going to let your light shine full of love in the middle of shopping season. <laughs> Um, But we've got people all around us. There are probably bullies in your family that want to intimidate you and put you down. You've got controllers, and and you've got ticking time bombs around. You just don't know when they're going to go off. You know, certainly that isn't any of us. But there are people in your life. You've got anti-Christians probably in your life, not just ones that don't love Jesus but are against Christianity, think it's stupid or whatever, and feel free to tell you on a regular basis. You've got non-listeners. You try to tell them, but they're just not there. Okay, those were the complacent ones, and hopefully the plugs are out of their ears. But our response is really, really important to them. Our response has got to be one of love towards the people that we're witnessing to. We don't want to stoop down to their level, whatever that is. Um, Right. For example, let's say you're driving in a car. And somebody cuts you off. Now, at that point, you have some options. Okay? 
but realize they're options. It's choice. Your behavior is choice. You choose your behavior. You choose it. I want you to think, if I do what I really want to do, would I be able to witness to that person? Okay. So let's say somebody cuts you off and you're like, oh, that person cut me off. So you decide to go and zip around in front of them and cut them off. Okay, that's stooping to their level. You do not want to stoop down to their level. That's, that's so, that's, you just don't want to go there, right? Or somebody bumps ahead of you in line and you're in like Kohl's on Friday morning after Thanksgiving and this line that goes all the way around the store and somebody just like, bam, cuts you off and people are swearing at each other and all that good stuff that goes on in those stores. And don't be one of those. Okay, Because you can't witness to the person afterwards if you start saying mean things to them or about them loud enough so they can hear it. Because heaven forbid you would say it directly. right? <laughs> By the way, that's called passive aggressive. It's still aggressive. It's still aggressive. Okay, uh, We don't want to stoop to their level. The, the James, in the book of James 119, it says, James 119, one verse, 119. My dear brothers and sisters... Take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. This is a great place to start because it's really practical. How can I love people? How can I love them? Starting here is a good place. Be quick to listen to what somebody has to say and slow to speaking and slow to become angry. Now, we know the book of James deals with all these actions. And tonight's all about actions. What actions are you going to take? Not theories, not just thinking about it up here somewhere, but what actions are we going to take in this coming week? So be quick to listen. People know whether you're listening or not, right? You know. If somebody's talking to you and you're looking away or you're, you're looking at your watch, you know that they aren't listening. When you listen to somebody, you have to give them your full attention. You look at them. Your body language will tell them whether you're listening or not, so you give them your full attention. And you can also, like, repeat things back. So if they say something to you, you could say, so you're saying da-da-da-da-da-da. That will also show them that you're listening. Be quick to listen because people love to talk, said the woman with the microphone. <laughs> They love to talk, and if you listen, they will talk more, okay? The key is to talk them to Jesus. Let them talk themselves right into the arms of Jesus. When somebody's talking to you, your brain shouldn't be thinking of how you're going to counter, counter their argument. Your brain should be listening. Find out where that person has come from first, and then bring them to Jesus, okay? Because they might not... You could be telling them about Jesus, but they could be like completely so lost it won't even permeate. So you let them start. Listen to where they're at. Ask them some questions. Be quick to listen. This is radical love. What I'm proposing tonight in the suggestions and the scriptures that I'm going to use is radical love. Okay, Radical love brings people to Jesus because they're attracted to it. They're attracted to Jesus who is love. God is love. They're attracted to the love of God. So be quick to listen, slow to speak. I'm going to suggest that, and I'm talking to myself just as much as you, that we, that we be careful not to open our mouth and put our foot into it. Okay? Be slow to speak. You might be at, for example, you might be at some holiday gatherings over the next month or so, and somebody's going to bring up politics. I'm just saying they will. Okay? Be quick to listen slow to speak, and slow to become angry, okay? Because you might lose them and the potential of not being able to witness to them, okay? Um, so be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. If you're a quick-to-be-angry person, like that's like your nature, oh, I just can't help myself kind of thing, I'm going to tell you that that is a choice to be that way. And, you know, if you really need help with anger issues, get the anger workbook. It's great. Les Carter's anger workbook. Get it. Work through it. Work through your anger. You can do this. But if somebody's making you angry, walk away. Just walk away from them. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to defend God. 
I mean, don't get mad at someone because they don't believe in God. You don't have to defend God. God's really big. If someone says, I'm angry at God, and you're like, don't be angry at God. You can't be angry at God. For goodness sakes, let them be angry at God. It's not like God doesn't know that they're angry at him. It's not like God can't handle their anger. He can. He can. So let them speak and listen. Listen to where they're at. Maybe somebody doesn't follow Jesus because they're really hurting Okay, something really bad happened in their life, and they can't possibly believe that there's a God because of that awful thing. I have a person in my life like that. And when his mother died while he was in high school, he said, I don't believe in God because God wouldn't kill my mother. Okay? So you've got a mis- mixed up, twisted theology, but you find out where they're coming from first, and then love on them. Find out. You don't have to defend it. Radical love is quick to listen. Radical love is slow to speak. And radical love is slow to become angry. All right, let's take it up a notch. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, right? How many people in here that were married at one point or another had the 1 Corinthians 13 read at their wedding? Two. Okay, nobody. Oh, three, three, four, five, six. You not don't admit it. What? <laughs> you didn't have First Corinthians thirteen. Our, we had the Great Commission in our wedding. You know, <laughs> not bad. You know, in in my name will they pick up serpents? You know, like we had that as one of our wedding themes. <laughs> and that wasn't a Catholic church. <laughs> Yes, it is true. But a lot of people have 1 Corinthians 13. And the thing that you need to know about 1 Corinthians 13 is that it's action. It's verb. You might say love is kind, and it sounds like a concept, but it's not a concept. In the Greek, it's a verb. Agape uh, agape is a verb. Okay? So it's a verb in the Greek. All these are verbs. It's not, oh, wouldn't this be a good idea to think about and meditate on because we're standing at the altar or something. But it's for us. This is the way we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live this way. And it starts out this way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So you can be totally Pentecostal. All right? You can be praying your little head off in tongues. But if you don't have the love, then you're sounding like a gong. Bong, bong. And that gong that they're talking about is the gong that, that announced pagan worship. I mean, not only was it a call to pagan worship. I mean, that's bad. He's really comparing it bad. You can speak in tongues till you're blue in the face. But if you don't have love underneath, you're just sounding like you're calling them to the pagan gods. Not so good. All right. Five, the gift of prophecy. And can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and have a faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I'm nothing. So you can be prophetic. You can have the gifts of wisdom and knowledge. All those gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12, you can have all of those. You can have faith. So much faith that people look up to you for your faith because your faith is on fire and your faith. But it's not, if it's not undergirded in love, you don't get any credit for it. <laughs> that sounds wrong, doesn't it? Um, it's nothing. If I have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, I mean, if I give it all away, if I give up, you might be the best giver in town. You might give money. You might give yourself. You might, I mean, give, you know, your time and your efforts and, and are a real giver. And that's fantastic. But it's got, the motivation has got to be love. Because everybody around will know it. The non-believers, they can pick up on, not lo- on, on things that aren't loving. You can witness to them, and you can have faith. Oh, you're going to come to the Lord. I know you are. Slap, 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 slap. Okay. They're not going to come to the Lord because it's not going to do anything. You are nothing. It just sounds like a clanging cymbal. Okay? So love is patient. Love is patient. Like at the line at Walmart. Okay, love is patient. Let's make this real, right? At the grocery store, stuck in traffic, love is patient. Love is patient. Love is kind. Kindness is things that you do for people. These are verbs. This is action things. And that's what God was speaking to us tonight about taking these outside the four walls of the church. 
radical love. Radical love is patient and radical love is kind. Radical love, um, it doesn't gossip. And it doesn't gossip about being gossiped about. You know, sometimes when we're hurt, somebody hurts us or says something or does something, and we just, this is so bad. Why are they doing that to me? You know, and you want to run and tell somebody. So-and-so just told me, da-da-da-da-da. Okay, you're perpetuating the gossip. You're doing the same thing. Jesus didn't speak a word when he was falsely accused. He didn't speak a word. Now, it's not like you aren't supposed to lodge a formal complaint at work or do something in your defense, but you aren't supposed to call all your friends and tell them about it. Because you don't want to spread dissension. People are watching. You want to spread love, love, God's love. You don't have to defend yourself. God loves you so much. He'll, do, he'll be your defense. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy it's a hard thing at Christmas sometimes when you're looking around and you're like, oh my gosh, I wish I had that family. I wish I had a, a marriage relationship like that couple over there. I wish I had more money like so-and-so. I wish I had, um, I wish I could cook, you know, stuff like that. Um, I wish I had the gift of prophecy or I wish I had the gift of, like that person. Why can't I have that, that that person have? That's envy. That's what that means. When you want something that someone else has, you're jealous of what they have, and that's what that is. But radical love does not have envy. Now, I'm probably just preaching to myself. I'm not here to rebuke anybody, but I do want you to see that our actions are important. Our choices that we make in life are, po- are important. So they can have eternal consequences for the people around us. Uh, radical love does not boast. Try not to talk about yourself at holiday gatherings. I challenge you, just listen to other people's stories and listen to what they have to say. Sometimes when families get together, they try to one-up men, you know, do I'm better, yeah, that's well, I, oh, did you, see, did you see, we have this new house, it cost $400,000, yeah, da, 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 and we got a great deal on it. Okay, really, you're boasting, come on now. Um, and if you're going to write Christmas cards, just make them honest, all right, like, Sally made the play, and she's covered in zits, but she's a high schooler, and what can you say? You know? You know what I'm saying? An honest Christmas card. Let's do honest ones. You know how we just make a brag sheet out of them? You know? Oh, my, my child is in the honor roll, and, and they did this, and they did this, and they were this in the play, and they, they were captain of the cheerleading squad, and they did this, and they did that, right? You didn't say any of the other things. Yeah, we had to put her into therapy. She's anorexic. You know, you didn't put any of those down. You know what I'm saying? So, and then you make everyone around you feel bad. It's really weird because I do a lot of counseling. I still do counseling. Um, that's a job job too but I do counseling and I see the weirdest stuff on Facebook I mean I will have just counseled this couple and they are like at each other's throat and yelling in my office and about an hour later she'll post this picture of the two of them Enoch with my love and my sweetie pie at you know big boy or whatever and I'm like wait a minute is this the same couple that was just in here you know it's it's weird um <laughs> Don't boast. Don't boast. Be honest with each other because then other because non Christians will be honest with you. You know, they're gonna say, Oh, my kid is addicted or I got this going on in my life. They'll be honest with you. Be honest back. Oh my gosh, I did that too. Oh gee. And it was really hard. And I know God loves me and God was walking along, but it was still really hard, even with Jesus. It's all right to be honest and say, But God helped me this way. That's radical love, doesn't boast. Radical love is not proud. The proud person says, I'm always right. Um, the, one of the musicians was off, and I'm going to analyze this, and I know that um, I would do it better, or I would do this, I. Any kind of proud statement usually starts with I. Radical love is not rude. Not rude. In other words, think before you speak. Radical love is not self-seeking. It's all about me. What am I going to get for Christmas? Okay. My, my friend, she got diamonds from her husband. Why didn't I get diamonds? I need diamonds. Just kidding. I don't need diamonds. I will tattle on him. 
The other day, I was at Kohl's at late. I had some coupons that had to be used before they closed that particular day. So I was in there after church, Wednesday night church, late. I'm at Kohl's. He calls. He calls me, and he says, Honey, I think you should just go over to the jewelry department and just pick out whatever you want. Okay, do not envy. Do not envy. I was like, okay. So I looked at all these sparkly things, diamonds and rubies and emeralds. And I had to say this before we took up the offering. And I looked at all those things. But I'm not really um, attracted to jewelry very much, except like really cool things like this necklace. But um, it's not my thing. But I was looked, I looked, and it was so sweet. I just felt so loved that he would tell that to me just to do that. Probably deep down he knew I wouldn't pick any diamonds. So I'm looking through. And... No, but the thing is, is he didn't know. He didn't know, and he would have been fine with it. I don't know if our bank account would have been fine with it, but he would have been. So I'm looking through, I'm looking through, and then I go over, because I wasn't going to go to the jewelry department at all. And I went over to the clearance section. That's my favorite section. And I found these earrings that I needed because I have this necklace and I don't have any earrings that match it. It's kind of a weird kind of color. So I went and I found this. I was so excited. It was like seven bucks. And I was like, yes. I was very excited. And so when I came home, you know, and he's like, did you go there? I go, yes. And I bought a pair of earrings and I'm so excited about them. They were seven dollars. Yeah. I think he was all right with that. I think you were all right with that. Yeah. <laughs> but that's self-seeking. It's all about me. What am I going to get for Christmas? Why don't I get mine? Why don't people love me? Why is it, you know, I need, you know, why am I going to get, that's self-centered. As Christians, we're supposed to be looking out, outward, at other people. Well, how can I help them? Jesus came, he laid down his life. No greater love than this, than one laid down their lives for their friends. Uh, radical love is not easily anchored. We talked about that with the first one. This is my favorite one in marriage counseling. Radical love, it keeps no record of wrongs. Every couple that comes in for marriage counseling has this giant backpack filled with, with things against the other one. And the first time they come in, they just want to take that backpack and open it all up in front of me and said, well, they're doing this and they're doing this. They did this five times. They did this since last year. They've done that 37 times. They've done this. Okay? That's keeping a record of wrongs. Ideally, if you have a falling out with someone, whether it be a spouse, a family member, a friend, a co-worker, take care of it right away so you don't have to carry it around in your backpack because you don't want to have to count all those later and say, oh, that's the 15th time they've done that, okay? Forgive them and, or talk to them about their, the, if they sinned against you, you go and you're supposed to go and talk to them about that. Go through that process, that forgiveness process with them. Now I'm going to take it up one more step. Okay, it was hard enough to do quick to listen, you know, be quick to listen, slow to speak. Slow. And then, oh yeah, the First Corinthians 13 was, those are pretty rough, but maybe doable with God's help. I'm going to take it up where it doesn't even seem doable. And that's from Luke chapter 6, verses 27. I'm going to like skip, just do a few verses here. This is the highest form of radical love. Jesus is doing the Sermon on the Mount, you know, all those really, really hard things that he says. But I, I say to you who hear, Luke chapter 6, starting verse 27. Okay, Luke chapter 6, verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Okay, this is really, really rough. And as a counselor, I know there are people in our lives that have just really hurt another person, and that's a process to get to this place. But Jesus is leading us in this direction. He's saying, love your enemies. So if there's somebody at work that drives you crazy and that's like, is just rude every day and is just, and you just feel like, oh, I just hate this person. Just, oh, I do not like this person. Maybe they're the ones that are next to get saved. You just don't know. Okay? So you start praying for them. You start softening that ground by prayer first. But do good to those that hate you. Do good. Not just because you're heaping burning coals on their head as a retribution, but 
because God has told us to do this. This is, this is radical love. We want to win the lost, and that's through radical love. Verse 27 again, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you. In other words, don't curse back. Okay, If they're saying bad things about you, don't run to the person next to you and start saying bad things about them. Did you see what they did? Okay, Don't do that. That's opposite of the kingdom, living kingdom life. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Pray for them. Pray for them. Soften the ground so they can get saved. Maybe you'll get things, you know, worked out in the long run. The fastest way to, to bring an enemy in is to get, bring them to Jesus. Then all of a sudden they'll be your friend. Verse 31 says, treat others the same way you want them to treat you. Okay, that's like, we tell our kids that all the time, right? That's like the, one of those golden rules, right? Treat others the same way you would want to be treated. But do we really stop and think about that? Do we do that? Do we let someone ahead of us in the line? Do we, do we wish someone a good day? Do you ask them if you've had a, they've had a bad day, if you don't know them? And if they're enemies, now this isn't talking about national enemies. This is talking about individual people that are in your life that you consider an enemy to you that says evil and bad things or does evil and bad things. Um. Verse 36, and that's in Luke 6, says, Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. And by the way, all the verbs in this section are continuous action verbs, meaning not just a, do, are we supposed to be merciful now, but we're supposed to be merciful tomorrow and merciful the next day and merciful the next day. Not just this one instance. It's like, yes, I was merciful today. Sweet, I'm done. I don't have to be merciful anymore. Okay, yeah, that's actually not what it says. I'm just going to fill you in there because it doesn't come out in English. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. And how are we merciful? We're merciful by verse 37. It says, do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. So if you want to be merciful to someone, you don't judge them. Let's say you're meeting someone for the first time and somebody gossiped and said, oh, well, that person, you know what they did 10 years ago, blah, 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 Okay, so you're already seeing through this lens of unmercifulness and judgmentalness. And God's saying, don't do that. Maybe they changed in 10 years, you know. Um, don't judge and don't condemn them. Pardon them. Forgive them. Maybe they have changed. You know, sometimes when we work with, uh, when people go and they work with people in jail, they expect them to be bad, right? <laughs> I mean, they're in jail, right? It's not like the person in jail is saying, I'm a really good person. They already know they're in trouble if they're in jail. So they, then they open up and can be honest, and you can be honest too. Don't judge them or condemn them or, you know, it but love them. That's what radical love is. That's how you bring people in the kingdom. Maybe they've never even experienced love before in a real way. Just you going in and bringing the light of Jesus, the powerful love of Jesus in to the jails or to your workplace or wherever, it could change, change them, change the whole atmosphere. Okay. There's this really great quote by this... Um, person, she wrote a book, her name is Elizabeth Brown, and she wrote a book called Living Successfully with Screwed Up People, okay? I love this book as a counselor, Living Successfully with Screwed Up People. She has some great suggestions in there, but one thing that she wrote, a quote from there is, wrong actions are wrong. Wrong responses to wrong actions are equally wrong. So, somebody disses you, you choose how you're going to react. Are you going to react? If you aren't going to react well, then leave for a moment. Compose yourself, pray, whatever you need to do, and then come back. Be careful. You can choose how you react. So if someone does a wrong, our wrong responses to their wrong actions are just as wrong. So if somebody does something bad to you and you react, you're going to have to go back and apologize for that. So save time. Don't do those. And, uh, easier said than done. But uh, I know it's easier said than done. I have the prayer of St. Francis to, to hand out tonight. 
because if you keep it folded up in your pocket or folded up and just in your wallet or um, you carry it around and you're having a rough time and you're just like, oh, Lord, just help me. This is what the prayer of St. Francis said. Whether he wrote it, we don't know, but he gets credit. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is dying that we are born to eternal life. So that's the prayer of St. Francis. It's very famous. And it's uh, it, my sixth. I went through Catholic school in sixth grade. My, our nun made us the whatever the after lunch nun that I went to her class. She made us say this every single day, and we would just go, you know, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace, because you know, we're sixth grade. But you know what? It sunk in. If I ever see that nun again, maybe in heaven, I'm gonna thank her because it sunk in. And and if you're having a really hard day and you're like, oh. You know, you pull out that prayer of St. Francis and you pray it. Pray it to God. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace in the middle of this situation. Or this work situation is really hard and people are just flying, you know, back and forth with all this darkness. Where there's darkness, let me bring light. Let me be the one that brings the light. Let me be the one that's an instrument of your peace. Let me sow love. Let me bring joy. It's a kind of a reminder of living that radical love that will bring people into the kingdom. People will know. If you walk and have radical love, people will know you're different. They may not know just by your living. I mean, with St. Francis, the one that's credited with saying, you know, preach Jesus wherever you go, and if necessary, use words. Okay? That was, it's credited to him. And um, we are preaching Jesus with everything that we do in our daily lives. And if you have radical love, I'm going to pray and anoint people tonight for that radical love. If you have that radical love, then the Holy Spirit can flow through you and open doors.